Hallelujah. How many are believing for a breakthrough today? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, as we look to your word, pray that your spirit would make it alive to our hearts. We ask, Lord, for major breakthrough today in the lives of your people. And we thank you in advance for the victories that will be won even in this place today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated if you're able. This morning, I'm going to talk about how to handle discouragement. Anybody here been discouraged? Well, uh, apparently the message is not appropriate for three-fourths of you then, huh? Come on, how many, everybody's been discouraged at one time or another, right? Yeah, yeah. I knew your arm just was locked up, that's what it was. Yeah. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Let's look to the Word today. Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with the co that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The Apostle Paul's apostleship is being challenged by this congregation here in Corinth. He founded this church six years before on the occasion of this letter being written year 57 AD, he's come back to, to minister and to speak to this church. He's been gone now for four and a half years and it's the fall of 57 AD now. And the exchange of these letters take place of first and second Corinthians uh, within a period of weeks between each letter. And after he had written the first letter, there were people that raised question or challenged his right to correct them or instruct them as he, as he did in that first epistle. And Paul's not a man that's defensive for his own right. His defense is of his apostolic ministry, and he's concerned about the interest of this church. That if they defy what is intended to be a service and blessing to them, that they misunderstand what he's trying to do, then they will not receive the help that he intends to, them to receive from what he believes God has told him to say to them. He wants to protect them from their own confusion that apparently is going on in this church. But there are always people who don't know when you're trying to help them. And the Corinthians seem to have a sizable club like this. And so 2 Corinthians is full of emotion. And the Apostle Paul in the fourth chapter, he says, we're hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. And he's talking about a flow of emotion that he wants to help these people and he's getting flack back from them. In that context, he sets himself to address very pointedly a clique that's in this church that need confrontation. And he said, it'd be good for them to know that we're not going to deal with this matter just in human political terms. The use of the word carnal here, speaking of some kind of a way of dealing with things, carnality, he's speaking about in the sense of restricting or limiting of human resource. Carnal living is not only expressed in carnal indulgence and sinfulness, but it's one way the flesh expresses itself, but it's also carnality restricts what God wants to do, because the flesh will always be a hindrance to what the Holy Spirit's wanting to do in our lives. As sincere and devoted it may be, it simply won't get us very far. And the power of God's Spirit and the truth of the Word is the only thing that will bring something about. So Paul says in, in the fourth verse, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And he's describing his recognition of two things. The struggle that's going on in that church appears to be a personality conflict between Paul and a group of people there. But Paul is saying it's bigger than that. It isn't something that he's willing to reduce himself to by saying, you know, if you want to have it out, let's just go out there in the parking lot and let's settle this. There's an understanding here that there's an assault of hell that's involved. The assault is on him and, and he's not paranoid. He is recognizing that whatever's going on right now in this church is far bigger than a personality conflict. The enemy is trying to bring confusion to this church. The enemy is trying to sidetrack this church. And the result always is discouragement. The word discouraged or downcast is a word familiar to all of us. The definition of discourage means simply discourage. Discourage. And discouragement has to do with precisely the opposite of what there is with confidence or boldness. It's a reflection of those things that rise against our sense of confidence and certainty. When you're discouraged, you don't feel confident. When you're discouraged, you don't feel certain about things. Things are kind of up in the air when I, when I feel discouraged and down. Everybody in this room has had times and beyond the walls of this place when you felt like there's just a cloud around you. Like you cannot measure fog. You stand in the middle of things and, and you, it reaches out in all kinds of directions and you, it's like there's a sense that intrudes itself on you and the sunlight in your life. And sometimes you have difficulty defining it. I just, you know, I just felt this, it's a cloud over me. You know, that's why I, uh, I pray for those people who live up in Seattle. Because, you know, they get rainfall more days than they get sunshine. And the, the rate of depression in the Seattle area is the highest in the United States. Because they don't see the sun enough. I like the sun, how about you? Kind of lost that in North Carolina too. But there's this feeling that comes over you. It's not a matter of whining over it. It's a matter of, you, you just, just don't know how to deal with it. And Paul, in the middle of what is a distressing situation, as he deal with, deals with the Corinthians, in these ver opening verses of chapter one, he, he talks about this kind of thing. Because what happens is, for some people, when they face these kind of situations, their first response is to run from the problems. Withdrawal. And how does the average American deal with it? Let's get a pill or let's get a little alcohol in us. You know, it, it doesn't solve your problem, it just irrigates it. And what happens with Christians is they just stop serving they stop helping. It amounts to succumbing to this idea, I want you to listen to me, this idea, and it's this, I don't have any value. You see, that's how it distills. I've lost my value. That's what discouragement does. You're disappointed with yourself. That's why I said two or three weeks ago, uh, some of us have spent way too much time with ourselves in this pandemic. That's why November is going to be the month when we get our eyes off of us and on people in Greensboro that need God's help and need Jesus. There's an idea. You stay long enough in, a, in that bubble, you stay long enough cooped up, you're going to get discouraged if you're not careful. And that's my my desire for everybody who's unable to get to church or, or, or unable to, to come during this pandemic and, and still the majority of our church family. My prayer is that they'll still be tracking with what God's doing in our church, tracking with what we're saying in the, this pulpit Sunday after Sunday after Sunday because this COVID will be over. And I don't want you to be six months behind the rest of this church if you're staying at home. I want you to keep tracking with us so that we're ready as a church to, to move forward to be all that God's called us to be. 
And as I deal with this subject this morning, I want to preface it by, by putting into perspective a couple of things that I want you to agree with me on this morning. And here's the first one. I am the focus of God's purpose and work in this world. Let me say it one more time. I am the focus of God's purpose and work in this world. Therefore, I will be susceptible to the enemy's attack. There's no escaping that fact. You are of great significance to God's purpose. It's extremely difficult to communicate that so that some of you will really understand it this morning. Not, not that the majority of us doubt that. The majority of us know enough about the Word of God and understand enough about human destiny to know that that's the truth. I may not understand all the details of it. It's not a matter of some kind of conceited thing of, of importance. It's not some chest-beating kind of thing. It's that we know God has a plan for our lives. You may not understand all of it today, but you know he has a plan for your life and you're open to that. But there's just enough people in this gathering and those watching me right now. You were raised with such dehumanizing culture where you've, you've been beat down and you've lost your sense of worth and so people like that, when they hear me say, well, you're, you're a highly significant person. God has divine intent for you. You're the focus of, of God's divine value. When, when people hear me say that, they're thinking, well, he's just being nice. Well, isn't that wonderful? He's just being nice. No, 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 no. There's far more to that, to that than me being nice. I'm telling you what the Bible says about every one of us in this place today that before you were conceived in the womb, before your parents existed, God had you in mind. You were known in his mind and in his heart before the worlds were. Hear me today, every man and woman in this room and everybody beyond the walls of this place today, you are the focus of God's intended purpose for this world. It's not about the stuff. It's about you. God died for you. He gave himself for you. He has plans for you. He has destiny for you. You are the focus of God's intended purposes. Come on, somebody. It doesn't mean you existed back then. You're not having some recycling experience. But everything focuses on this go around, whatever years you've got. This is it. And it's enormously significant, not only to, to see that and see it, but it's, it's a pathway of how you get through this world. You're enormously significant to the Father. He arranged your life in his mind and purpose that these two things are true. There's potential for real fulfillment according to his plan for your life. Everything I do today in my ministry is to say to people, God has a destiny for you. God has a purpose for you. God has a plan for you. I don't want anything to rob you of God's divine destiny for you. God's plan, his purpose is the most incredible thing that could ever happen to you. You're the focal point of God's purpose and work. Therefore, you become the focus of Satan's assault. Because if there's anything the adversary is aware of, is that God has a plan for you. And since the life of God in you will make a difference in others, because those are the two things that I want you to see today. There's a potential for real fulfillment for your life as you walk with him. Secondly, it will make a difference in the lives of other people. Amen? Amen. It'll make a difference. In the, you are the focal point of God's purpose for your life. And if God can fulfill his purpose in your life, it's going to impact positively everybody else in your life. The enemy wants to rob you of everything God has planned for you. He wants to discourage you. He wants you to withdraw. 
He wants you to decide never to come back to church again after the COVID's over with. I already know what he's telling some of you. He's a liar. And the reason he's telling you that is because he don't want you to have what God has for you. Just so you know. And so Paul is in the middle of all of this. And that's why, you know, there are people in the church here who've written me little notes that, that just mean so much to me because people say to me, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. I don't take that lightly. I'm still here. I'm still functioning because people pray. Family, friends that, that, that I know carry me in prayer every day. That's, that's how I'm able to function because I know the enemy wants to take me out. And when we look at this circumstance here, there's some words that Paul talks about in verse four and five about what the enemy has done, tried to do. And he talks about the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations or arguments, casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into obedience. Four words here, strongholds. Strongholds are like imprisonments. The second word is arguments. It's like a rebuttal. Every, every time you, God tells you something, every time you read the word, the enemy wants to rebut that in your life. You read, if God's for me, who can be against me? The devil says, huh. I guess you must have forgot where you came from. I guess you must have forgot your mistakes. I guess you must have forgot the weakness. See, he's going to rebut everything of the word of God in your life. Arguments. The third word here is high things. He's talking about demon beings. They crowd in. Every high thing that boasts itself above the knowledge of who God is. Ephesians says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. High things are those things that elevate themselves above the knowledge of God. How many times have you had the experience in the middle of some kind of difficulty or discouragement or depression or whatever it was that, that you thought you could be able to think about something positive or, or a verse of scripture or a song or, or something, and sometimes you just feel so overwhelmed, you, you can't even think about a scripture to help you. You can't even get something in, the, in your mind that's positive. And those kind of things happen when we can't seem to get anything right in our heads. There are high things that are boasting themselves against what you already know about God. And the last word here is thoughts. It's an impressive word because it's not just thoughts like random thoughts, it's plots and plans that the enemy has. Let's just unpack them for a moment. The first word is prisons. That's kind of the way I, I've felt from time to time. I've always thought about strongholds as like a fixed place, but, but over the last few months as we've gone through this pandemic, there are times when you just felt, felt like you're hemmed in. You're, there's something restricting you. There's something restraining you. When I was locked up for four months, you know, and at my place, you know, uh, and couldn't travel, couldn't go anywhere, uh, couldn't do anything. I mean, I, I mean, I'm chewing on doorknobs. I mean, I'm wired for, for movement. And it's just so easy to feel like you're, you're just trapped. But it's, it happens. But the Bible says these strongholds need to be cast down. It, it's interesting that that's precisely what the word, the, the reversal of, of, uh, of downcast is. When you're downcast, cast down. Cast down those things. That imprisonment has a counterpart in the scripture. Paul is in Philippi. He, he hadn't been in town very long before they put him in jail. There's an earthquake that comes and shakes them and they get out of prison and, and uh, that's what they were to Paul and Silas and come to penetrate Europe with the gospel. And I thought, you know, that's what's going on for us in, in our own world. All of us are at a time right now in the, the transition of this great church. 
There's, there's, there's the possibility, the great possibilities of, of the breakthroughs of a new day and a new opportunity. And this room is full of people that, that's exactly where you are right now. Coming out of this COVID in the next few months, we believe for major breakthroughs that are gonna happen so that, that the new day, there's a new day God is planning in purpose for us because we're not wasting this pandemic. We're letting it help us to get our own acts together so that we can be what God's called us to be when we get out of this mess. This is gonna be over. To me, the greatest verse in the Bible is it came to pass. It didn't come to stay, it came to pass. And Paul and Silas set free and they, begin, they just begin to sing and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. The second is the word arguments. Strongholds have to be cast down. The second thing is arguments or imaginations. The rebuttal of the adversary. Has anybody here had times where you, you thought things come to your mind uh, 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 that are rebuttals against God's purpose? People think, well, you know, I'd just be better off if I was just out of the way. Somebody told me that this week. And there are people that the enemy just gives suicidal thoughts to because of that. You know, God has a high purpose for you and so it's no wonder the devil wants to get you out of the way. Paul stood in the face of the opposition with the Corinthians. He could have said, well, you know, I've been, been here 18 months, four years ago, and you know, I, if, if, you know, if you don't like what I'm saying, you can just lump it. I got plenty of things to do somewhere else. But Paul said, you know what? Whatever's going on here right now, this is more than just flesh and blood. There's an enemy who's trying to create a problem in this church. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, mighty through God. And the arguments that come to you, I hope that you've been around long enough to, to be able to discern those arguments so that you realize, you know, that doesn't sound like God. The Holy Spirit never condemns people. Did you know that? The Holy Spirit convicts people. Amen. Condemnation is the work of the enemy to put you down, keep you down, and make you think there's no hope for you. Amen. This will never change. This will never be different. That's the condemnation of the enemy in your life. When the Holy Spirit's at work in your life, he convicts you about what's going on in your life and gives you hope that you can get out of it. Amen. The devil never gives you hope. He just keeps saying it's gonna get worse and worse. He's a liar. Unless you choose to believe him. The third thing is high things. There's a great story in the scripture. It involves some peculiar names, Sennacherib, Rabshakeh, and Hezekiah. Sennacherib was the king of the world's dominant power at that time. They were a powerful, powerful army. Everybody who came up against them were ground to powder. And they'd come now from the north down with threatening Judah and the city of Jerusalem. Ramshakeh was the general, Sennacherib's general. And he's leading the troops. There are 100, or excuse me, 200,000 of them. It's a pretty good army. And they're north of Jerusalem ready to lay siege on the city, and Ramshakeh sends this declaration to Hezekiah. It was delivered in the form of a document that said this, we've been through all these other nations, and their gods couldn't stop us. What makes you think that your Jehovah God could stop us? We're about to crush you. Hezekiah gets this document, and he goes into the temple and he spreads the document before the Lord. And he says, Lord, they're treating you like you're one of those pagan gods. Like you're some God made of sticks and stones. Lord, I'm opening this document before you to tell you there's not anything we can do to defend this city. I want you to see how they're talking about you. Have you ever gotten an email you wanted God to see? Maybe. 
And so Hezekiah said, Lord, I, I want you to read this email. They're talking about you. And he just kind of lays it out there. I want you to see, Lord, what they're saying about you. The Bible says that the next night, 185,000 troops died. There's no explanation for it. And the illogical explanation is, is that they, they died in their tents because some toxic fumes came out of the earth and killed 185,000 of them. You see, God has chemical warfare too. It's the retaliation against the works of hell. The angel of the Lord passed through the camp. God sent a messenger. It was an angel that came and took care of it with one sweep of his sword. Deliverance came just that quick. These are stories in the word of God to try to help us recognize that whatever it is we're dealing with, there's a God who is bigger than whatever that circumstance is. There's a God who's bigger than the adversary. There's a God who's more powerful than whatever's going on right now. We had a situation in our church uh, many years back. One Saturday morning, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, uh, the enemy is wanting to create some confusion in our church. We're going through a very, very uh, challenging time, a major building program and a lot of stuff going on in our church. And that church had, had grown very rapidly over several years. And the Lord says, there's a... Is an enemy who wants to create confusion in this church. It was so strong, I felt it so strong I couldn't shake it. And so I called our staff, our elders, and I said, I need you to meet me at the church Saturday night at six o'clock because we got to deal with something. We met together at six o'clock and I said, here's what I feel like the Holy Spirit's saying to me. The enemy is wanting to create some place of confusion and get a place in this church. And I said, the only way I know to deal with it is in the spirit. So we spread out across our campus and all the buildings. And we began to pray over everything. Took authority over the powers of darkness that would invade our church in any way, shape, or form. For about two hours, we were everywhere praying, putting, laying hands on on chairs and you name it, we were doing it. That may sound weird to you, but it, I don't mind being weird. <laughs> About eight o'clock, I called everybody back in the sanctuary and I said, I, I feel the release now that I needed to feel about this. So everybody went home. Next morning, first service. Went pretty normal and uh, into the service, we had people that came to Jesus and just a great, great time. When I walked out on this, for the second service, there was a, a couple that had been, been a part of a, uh, a situation of constant conflict with our, in our church. And for some reason, they were seated on the, on the front row in the second service. I thought, well, maybe this is what I'm gonna deal with today. We went through that service I preached, we had an altar service, and uh, at the end of that service, I was down in the altar area praying with people, which is what I miss so much, just so you know. I miss altar times. And uh, I was down praying with people, and I looked up and I saw that this couple was still seated on the front row. I mean, they were just seated right there in the front row. The, most, of, most of the congregation had already left the building. And they're, they're like frozen in their seats on the front row. And I looked up at the moment that this woman said to her husband, I can't talk. I can't talk. That's the last day I saw those people. You know when that battle was won? On Saturday night. I didn't have to do it. Yeah, some of you are getting scared right now, aren't you? Yeah. I didn't have to do it, though. The Lord took care of it. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. They're mighty through God. The Lord said, I became Hezekiah's strength, and I'll be yours. Paul and Silas are trying to penetrate a new arena. I'm, I'm trying to, too. This church is moving forward, too. And God says, I'm going to be your defense. In case after case, 
The Bible supports the fact that these four words cannot hold us back. They're not just a set of words. They are things that reflect the kind of things that the enemy wants to do to rob us of our future. And there are two things that I believe the Lord is saying to us we need to do. When we're facing discouragement, when we're facing arguments from, from the enemy, when we're facing plans and plots of the enemy to sabotage God's plan in our lives, when we're, we're facing high things that we try to exalt themselves above the knowledge of who God is. The message here is not to scare you today about all that. The message here is to let you know that you don't have to put up with that. That you don't have to succumb to those things. Because God has plans and purposes for your life. And if you're going to live in victory, even in this pandemic, two things I think are important. Number one is you got to see yourself in the Word of God. Lord, when I'm discouraged, I just remember that Elijah was too. But you were, you showed up. You opened his eyes and he could see there's far more for us than there are than against us. When you're facing those circumstances and you realize that, that that little voice on your shoulder that's trying to sabotage your, your life and your heart and your feelings, you recognize that's not God. That's an enemy who's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. See yourself in the Word. See yourself like Paul and Silas in prison, but at the midnight hour, God shows up and intervenes. See yourself in that situation where Hezekiah says, Lord, I don't know what I'm gonna do. They're, look what they're saying about you. And the Lord says, I can take care of it. The Lord's wanna say something to somebody in this room right now, just like that, I'll take care of it. If you'll recognize it's not about flesh and blood, you can argue till the cows come home and nothing's gonna change because there's some issues that are not about personality. There's some issues that are not about a conflict in your family. It has to do with hell coming against your place and your business. But I came here to tell you, if you'll see yourself in the Word, then you know you're gonna be victorious. I said, you know you're gonna be victorious. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This past week, I received a phone call from my son who works for me and with our business things we have and and it wasn't a good phone call he was telling me stuff that's going on and i sat there in that car as i'm driving down the highway and i thought oh lord i just don't know what i can take any more of this because it just keeps piling on and i started to remember the sermon i was going to preach today you see, I probably need this worse than you do. And I realize that no matter what's going on, what, what of hell that's coming against our business right now, we're doing everything that we believe God's called us to do. And I did just like kind of what Hezekiah did as I was driving in the car. I said, Lord, you know, you heard the report that I just got on the phone. But I believe and trust that you're gonna see us through to victory. You're gonna see us, see us through to victory. Because your word is true. I said to friends in the first service, you know, when are we going to come to the point that we stop letting our feelings decide what's true? The word of God is what's true. Let every man be a liar. Facebook is not true. Twitter's not true. Every political ad you've heard in the last week has some truth and some untrue in it. So I can't rely on those. But I can rely on the Word of God. So it doesn't matter how I feel. I said it doesn't matter how I feel. Isaiah chapter 51. Verse 11. So the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing 
with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that should be afraid of a man who will die and of the son of man who will be made like grass? And you forget the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth. You are feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor when he has prepared to destroy. And when is the fury of, where is the fury of the oppressor? The captive exile hastens that he may be loosed, that he may, should not die in the pit and that his bread should not fail. But I am the Lord, your God, who defied the seas that roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in your mouth. Are you, anybody getting this? I have put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand that I might plant the heavens, lay the foundation of the earth and to say to Zion, you are my people. Hallelujah. See yourself in the word. And the second thing you need to do is lift a song to the Lord. Worship is an instrument of victory. Every time the children of Israel went to war, the singers led in front of the army because the singers were singing praise and glory and honor to the Lord. The singers were saying, our God is bigger. Our God is more powerful. Our God is mighty. So that all the soldiers could hear it. I don't know whether you realize it, but, uh, but Satan was thrown out of a worship team in heaven and showed up in somebody's worship team here. I don't know, <laughs> wasn't here. The song of the Lord in the midnight hour, the song of the Lord.